Thank you, Hans and Gültin, for um, this wonderful conference every year. For me, it's the third time. For many of you, it's the 10th or 15th or 13th time, 12th time. For me, it's, it's always a, a, a big uh, pleasure to come here and to share these ideas with, with you and to enjoy the hospitality of, of um, generosity of, of this house. Now this, this um, subject here, suing the state for independence, actually it's a bit the same subject I talked about two years ago and one year ago, and I must ask you for apology that I cannot yet report that this lawsuit is done and that we won the case, at least not in Switzerland. We still have a terribly strong state in Switzerland. Maybe you think that in Switzerland it's not as bad as at other places. That could be perhaps, but I can tell you it's bad. <laughs> and as many of you know, perhaps that I'm practicing lawyer, including litigation. Um, I'm also a professor of private law and theory of law, which is something like philosophy of law. And I live in Switzerland, so it's not very surprising that I come to the idea to sue the Swiss state um, now for, for something. Huh? And this is what I wanted to talk about more in detail. Um, last time, because it's always a bit a similar um, point of view from the legal point of view to this uh, problem, the last time I enumerated some, some uh, sorry, some, some points. Um, what will we sue the state for? Some very specific points, such as for forcing people to compulsory, sorry, here we are, for forcing people to go to school, typically the schools operated by the state, or for forcing people to annually pay a part of their income or wealth to the state or there are many things, and this is just a list of examples, for forcing young men to render personal services during many months of their life, or for impeding people from doing certain business activities, and all this without the people having consented to it or given other causes for it. If they would have consented, that would not be a bigger problem, but the problem is that all these um, um, enforcements are uh, against um, the consent of the people. Or to put it uh, more general, I think I take always the, the wrong button, but um, in a more general thing, it's we can sue the state for forcing the people to compulsory membership. Maybe this is the overall problem we have with the state, not just the single um, subjects of application of this arrogance, but that in principle you are obliged to um, obey to all this as a member, so to speak, of this whole organization. Or for behaving like an aggressive gang. This is the notion I used last time. An aggressive gang forcing all other gangs um, to, to submission. I mean, there are many gangs in a country like Switzerland, many um, enterprises, organizations, or gangs, if you want to give them a negative touch. There are many, but what is the speciality of this organization called state is that they are the very first gang. So to sue the state for being the first gang or just to put it in short terms for being the state. 
So this is in principle what we try to sue him for. So this membership, so the dependence on him, the unconditional dependence on him, this is what I wanted to speak a bit more in detail today. So I, I like to, to draw pictures and um, so last time too we, we, we had some, we de developed some, some, you know, parties, how they interact and things like that. And the picture a bit, a bit like that was this. Um, so we have this, this first gang here, you know, he is big, he is aggressive, he is red for that. Um, um, and he makes here aggressive actions against this group of people. Um, these are victims of this aggressivity. In the lawsuit we are um, thinking about now, they will be the plaintiffs. Um, and then these people, I, I made them green as a contrast to the aggressive red. Um, you see there are many people, some are somehow also within that first gang. So, so there we have a, a vague uh, aspect of are they in that group or are they outside? Are they members of it or are they just victims, ex external victims, so to speak, of it? So this is what I wanted to, to show a bit with this um, picture. And in the case yeah, now of, of of the, the Swiss state, the federal state actually, I do not speak about the cantons, um, in the case of the um, federal state, this big gang, this first gang is not that big, it is uh, 40,000 people are working there, so maybe it's a considerable enterprise, but it's not, you know, the country. It's not the 8 million people living in Switzerland, it's just a small gang of 40,000 people. So this is the outset of our um, uh, discussion now. You know him, huh? Actually, it's, it's, this one is the same, you know, from another picture. Um, I also put it, put it red. Um, the picture is a bit squeezed, I think, but that's a question of the beamer. So, uh, I do not want to express some specific thing with that. So, but uh, you know Leviathan on Thomas Hobbes' book cover, um, this uh, aggressive giant consisting of many, 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 many people. You know, this, this body here, as you know, certainly consists of many people. And now we go to this first gang and say, you are aggressive against us. And his answer will be, no, I'm not aggressive, I'm not red. Imagine I'm green, I'm soft, I'm smooth. Actually, I'm not aggressing you. Um, I am your mutual cooperation. We cooperate together. You do not see it correctly. So this is the picture he wants to give us. Um, as a response on our first um, blade. And then he says something, look at my belly. This is just you. Maybe the picture is not that, that clear now, but uh, there are many, many people, so this is you. Huh? You form all together this body. And he says, um, my head which is perhaps a bit impressive, which could give you the idea of aggressiveness. Actually, this head is not on the top. Actually, imagine this head is down there somewhere. Huh? This is what he tries to, to show us in order to calm us down. Or, now let's make it a bit more um, technically, he says, you are the members of this group. On the top, of course, you are the sovereign, so to speak. This is you, the members. We are a big cooperative. I am just here below the board and you 
give me by delegation these competences, by elections, by mandating me with certain uh, sub uh, tasks, by delegation of uh, liabilities to me. This is, he says, actually the situation. And then, of course, I will give you my services. So this is a circle of cooperation you give me, he says, the democratic legitimacy and I will give you good services. This is his, his answer once we approach him with the blame that he is um, attacking us. Or now this is cooperative, you know, the scheme of co-ops, which is a, a broad um, scheme uh, widely expanded uh, on the world these co-op organizations and he says actually I am an organization like that. Um, on the one hand, as I said before already, you are organizing self-help. This is the idea of cooperation. Um, you give me democratic delegation and legitimacy and on the other hand I give you our common goods and services. So this is this cooperative. This is his answer to our blame. Now there are interesting parallels between co-op structure and state. So it's not an accident that he argues with cooperation and with co-op. Namely in Switzerland, which is maybe funny, namely for Swiss, attendance, but uh, it's interesting how the terminology is. The official name of the federal Swiss state, so the central state, not the cantons, is this. This is the official um, logo, so to speak. Um, Schweizerische Eidgenossenschaft, in, this is the German version. And uh, as you know, the, the, the bigger part in Switzerland is German-speaking, so the notion Schweizerische Eidgenossenschaft is, is very um, often um, applied to talk about the state, the Schweizerische Eidgenossenschaft, and these other are then French version, Confédération Suisse, Fédérationne Suisse, Italian, and Confederation Svizzera, this is, is a Rum, Rumansch, Rumansch, huh? this is a, a, a small, it's a small minority in Switzerland uh, who speaks this, this fourth official language. So Schweizerische Eidgenossenschaft, or you can say if you translate it literally, it's Swiss Oath Cooperative. Um, when we heard about Oath, um, um, uh, relations in your speech from the Middle Ages, I thought about Schweizerische Eidgenossenschaft. This is not only a cooperative, but an oath cooperative. This is very, um, you know, strong, tied together. So just the notion, but of course not only the notion, the whole idea um, that the state is something like a big cooperation is not that far. And then he says, in this um, argument, he says, by the way, it's no accident that we are talking now about cooperative because there is indeed a strong cooperative movement which began in the 19th century and actually the situation for that, the picture is quite similar to the one you wanted to blame us for. We have a big power here on the right side, aggressive, red, and we have victims here, these green persons on the left side. And indeed, he says, our statist interlocutor he says, indeed, we had in the 19th century often situations like that where people said there is abuse of power against us, but not primarily in a political sense, 
but rather in an economic sense or in economic contexts, um, we were not, or these people were not uh, oppressed by state aggressiveness, but by poor quality, adulterated goods. This was the problem in, that, in those times that people could not afford any acceptable goods so that um, there were, um, in certain regions, um, economic problems. And then came up the idea of cooperation um, in order to avoid these humiliations, so to speak, by this economic power, you then develop the idea, we want to be more than just customers that can hardly afford these expensive and, and bad goods or housing or whatever it was. Then came the idea that you as customers would try to become part of those who supply these goods. So that they should become member of the supply side, not just be on the demand side and to be humiliated there by economic power, but to become member on the supply side. And from that idea became then this, this, this cooperative movement. Um, th there is, as, as some of you certainly know, these Rockdale pioneers that formed these, this system of cooperative uh, in order, maybe that's too small to read, to provide an affordable alternative to poor quality and adulterated food and provisions using any surplus to benefit the community. So um, all these um, advantages that were on the other side should now be also accessible to, to us, huh? to these um, former victims that shall become now proud members. There were customers or victims rather and now they become members. Um, there is this notion of mutualization. Um, in economic and business organization, this notion is sometimes um, used. Mutualization, which says that we change to a system of mutuality. Cooperatives are a structure of mutuality. Um, there are mutual credit institutes and so on, you know, this on, or there are insurances on a system of mutuality. In principle, this is what was formed by this idea by the, uh, the cooperative pioneers in the 19th century. Um, and then one could say this mutuality concept gives to the board which is of course on the bottom now, it's not the king, it's just the board, um, gives the, the task to care for all these goods and then this is what comes here. He gives then, unlike the former brutal economic power, he gives then high quality affordable goods to his members. We have again this circle of cooperation, while these form of poor quality and adulterated goods, they do not exist anymore. This is the concept of, this, um, of these cooperatives. And now, actually, we are not talking about cooperatives in the economic sense, we are talking about the state. And he said that there are some par parallelisms between these two structures, and now let's ask, okay, it, it seems to be the case indeed that, that it's quite similar, there are similar elements in it, and then let's now go back to the state and let's apply these cooperative aspects to the state. 
So if we have at the outset this situation that we have these humiliated subjects, we have from the state, not, not now these goods and services, but maybe this sub submission and coercion I mentioned in the beginning, and now comes this cooperative idea. And now, okay, why not these humiliated subjects now want to become member? So uh, along to this mutualization movement, one could say in the political context, democratization. So the former customers, or let's say um, subjects, uh, humili humiliated subjects perhaps, shall now become member of the whole organization they become proud citizens instead of humiliated subjects. They can say now, we the people. And we have a concept, an overall concept of mutuality, or of course you can call them, uh, you can call it democracy. And now it goes on with this cooperative aspects now you have the democratic aspect, maybe via a parliament. You have the government, which is nothing but the board of this cooperative. You have high quality and affordable services that this government now gives to his members. And of course, here with the state, we do not have, in this concept of the state, we do not have this submission and coercion anymore. This is what our interlocutor says to us. And this sounds nice and plausible and um, it's hard to find the difference to how we realize the situation is. Now let's go further. Um, these Rockdale's principles and um, maybe these are similar also to state principles. They were for formulated with um, many points that are indeed, again, quite similar to the state. One vote uh, by, by person, not by capital, but by, curse, by person, by head. Huh? One head, one vote. Um, political and religious neutrality. Um, this is what you often hear also from the state. Um, then what is interesting in these um, Rockdale principles, co-op education, encouragement for further cooperatives. So this is not just one organization, it's also something that has to do with the organization of society and therefore people must be trained in this, um, in, in, in this concept. So one could say this is sort of political principles. And then we have um, distribution of the sur surplus is not according to, to, to capital invested, but to trade how often you use the possibilities or the, the, the opportunities of the cooperative. Um, interest on capital are only on a limited basis. Um, cash trading, this is an interesting point. Um, um, if you get services from the cooperative, they must be paid cash and not just, you know, accredited. Because cooperatives often credit it to their members because they are generous, these are their members, and um, shortly they go bankrupt. So it's more a practicable but interesting point. Um, and these, one could say, are the economic principles. Um, Okay, so far, and now let's go back to our cooperative and say, but now there are also some risks. And uh, maybe these risks have to do with these principles or maybe with other aspects. So we have this, again, our cooperative. We have the former customers that became members um, and now you see some parts now are not green anymore. I put them now red. It is namely this concentration of power um, with the board or maybe there is a committee, you know, if it's a very big cooperative, 
uh, then it's not only the board, but maybe some assembly of delegates or things like that. And so um, quite often in such organizations, it could happen that some power is accelerated there and that they look for their own interest, all these things uh, one knows, with the effect, or at least with the risk of the effect, that these formerly so good and, and uh, cheap um, services are um, of bad quality. And once we thought that outside there that was bad quality for these um, customers. Oh, is, is it fine? I hope it was not because of these bad, good qualities here. Um, so, um, in any event, we, we, we see problems. Huh? Um, it's not that green um, as we, we heard of before. Uh, and again, we have within the concept, this time not outside, within the concept, we have these humiliating aspects we want to avoid. So one could say that was not a mutualization, or in the effect it was not, it was a pseudo mutualization, or those members became again victims, what they wanted to avoid. This is where they are. Or we have not a real mutuality anymore. Now, this picture, in a way, is not precise anymore because once those um, dominating the others um, are on the bottom of the picture, this is, this is not not, uh, this does not correspond to the group um, uh, situation. So uh, to, be, uh, to be more accurate by, by showing it, you have to put it the other way around. So um, the, the board actually is not as Leviathan tried to show us before. It's not um, here down. Actually, um, one should turn it from bottom up to top down. So actually, if you show the situation how it is after this power concentration began to abuse its, its possibility, then you have the board or this committee or how these instances are called, you have them in the um, upper part and the members are in the lower part and you have these quality goods that are given down there to the people, these bad services. You have these humiliation aspects there. So actually, this could be the, situa the, the picture of, of the real situation of, of a cooperative that could develop in such a direction. It's not sure, but at least you have the risk that the cooperative goes to that direction. And these uh, pioneers, they knew it because they really were in the practical life. And so they said, you have to give the possibility of demutualization. You have to give the people there, once they are down and not up anymore in this scheme, and once they are humiliated and not, not um, serviced, um, you have to give them a possibility to go out again. It corresponds to their right to go in before they also must have the possibility to go out. So this demutualization step. To become again customers and not um, remaining members. And then the idea was that once then they want maybe from the same situation um, buy goods, they have the chance that these goods are better because they are customers and if other suppliers are there, there is a certain um, competition and so on. So the idea is that um, because of this demutualization, they have the possibility to get to better um, goods and services. Then this is not a corporation 
a cooperation anymore, but maybe it's just an organization, a corporation. It sounds similar, but it's something quite different. A corporation and not a cooperation. Um, so one can say we have on this side not the concept of mutuality anymore, um, but we have the concept of trade. So these are the two alternatives we always have according to this cooperative principles. So one could say that there is something like a circle of life of cooperation. So the starting point is these victims, you know. In the trade world, they became victims, they mm, could not help herself, and then they decide to go into such an organization or to form such an organization, to become members, to start with a cooperation. Not to be in the trade anymore, but in the cooperation. Now, within the corporation, as we, we showed quite shortly, um, there could be a deterioration of the situation, so they become victims. And once this happens, it's the tendency again to come outside, to go outside this demutualization, to become again victims. And of course, if out there in the world of trade, necessity comes up and the situation deteriorates, they should have the possibility to go again in other structures, maybe to try it with cooperation. So this is a sort of, of game and of principles and of natural laws in a way that um, these um, cooperative movements realized in the nature and society. And I could imagine that indeed these are this kind of laws that are maybe not in, in some statutes, but, but that they are proven and plausible uh, kinds of behavior of people within society. Circle of life of cooperation. So here we have sort of right or possibility to enter into such an organization and of course also to get out of such a um, organization. And not by accident, um, I did not yet mention the very first principle of these um, Rockdale principles. It is uh, open and voluntary membership. This is the number one principle of cooperative structures. These other principles are they are often six or seven principles, if you look in, in history of, of these movements, and they are not quite the same sometimes. They are mixed up or, or, or separated, but the very first and, and um, um, uh, clear principle through all variants is open and voluntary membership. Open means you can go in. Voluntary means you can go out you know already what will be the, uh, um, the reason what I will give to the state with that. Um, we could say this is master, this is the master principle. Then maybe not to go deeper within, I have 10 more minutes, so um, this is not to go deeper into, but nevertheless that's also an interesting point um, that Education in cooperative um, structure means um, encouragement for other cooperatives, so to build up a society where you have alternatives in cooperative structures, this too. But the main point is the first one, open and voluntary membership. And now what is interesting, for instance in Swiss law, just as an example, um, and once I want to try to make something against the Swiss Federation, so why not to look in the Swiss statutes? But these are statutes that are quite similar or identical even in other traditional continental statutes, like in Germany, like in France, like in Italy. I hope it's the case, then you can confirm or object. Um, so these are these principles in principle, that, in principle that you find in all these uh, national statutes. And also if you go on, on, on the websites of, 
of, of big international cooperative movements, you find these principles. And now, in the statute, so this is Article 839, in this case, of the Swiss Code of Obligation, who says new members may be accepted into cooperatives at any time. Then, as usually, come certain exceptions. Providing principle of unlimited membership is respected. The Articles of Association may lay down more detailed provisions governing accession. However, they must not impose excessive obstacles to accession. So, in principle, you can go into. <coughs> now comes the interesting point. Um, provided no resolution has been made to dissolve the cooperative, I will come to that point later on, every member is free to leave. This is this main principle of exit um, in cooperative structures. And then again come certain exceptions or, or reductions, but the principle is always maintained. The Articles of Association may provide that the departing member is obliged to pay an appropriate severance penalty, where in the circumstances his departure causes the cooperative significant losses or jeopardizes its continued existence. So that could be expensive, huh? but point three, any permanent ban on or excessive obstacles to departure imposed by the Articles of Association or by agreement is void. So this penalty cannot be too high. In principle, you must be able to get out of this concept. And then it goes further. A member may be barred from leaving by the Articles of Association or by agreement for no more than five years. Okay, five years. Um, you can wait this time, but then finally you can go. Even during this period of time, uh, a member may leave for good cause and then some other um, um, details, but you have here this principle that you can leave and here um, a detail only as of the end of the financial year and on the expiry of one year's notice. These are really details or um, maybe um, in certain cases even earlier. But you see very detailed in principle you can go out. Um, what is also interesting, once uh, you can go out in certain cases you have the possibility to get the indemnity. Um, indemnity because you had a share in this cooperative and now you get out so they have to, to pay it, to pay you for it. Um, and the articles of association, they can determine this and, and some details how it should be calculated, but this too is an interesting point. Now we come back to the state and now Saying the state before you argued with cooperative, okay, let's argue now with cooperative elements. And so I tried to put in the same text everywhere where we had articles of association, I put constitu state constitution. And where they had member, we put citizen. And where we have the cooperative, we put state. And then we can show what the outcome is. Because these are principles that are plausible in this circle of cooperation. This is the point I, I keep now. And now, new citizens, if you put that. I, I can't call now this Schweiz um, um, Code of Obligation, Swiss Code of, of, of Obligation. Um, one could say these are now these natural rules of cooperation that are proven in practice. And according to these rules, now you can say new citizens may be accepted into a cooperative such as, for instance, the state at any time. This is the rule, you know, in, in society you can refer to. Providing the, the principle of unlimited citizenship is respected, the state constitution may 
lay down more detailed provision concerning accession. Maybe not just everybody at once. And now what is very interesting, provided no resolution has been made to dissolve the state, I will come back to this as said later, every citizen is free to leave. That's this main principle. Then the state constitution may provide that departing citizens citizen is obliged to pay an appropriate severance and so on um, if it causes the state significant losses. Any permanent ban or excessive obstacle to departure imposed by the state constitution or by legislation is void. A citizen may, may be barred from leaving by the state constitution or by legislation for not more than five years. That could be a nice perspective. So you can wait five more years and then they must um, get you free. And so all these exceptions, I have it, have it here too, that in principle, even though a certain payment must be made and so on, finally comes the point where you really have to um, be free and have the right to get out of this state cooperative. It goes through all these. I uh, abbreviate it a little bit. I also skip this situation where I wanted to show some detail point to discuss with the state in that um, process of exit out of the state, of this demutualization process, and come now finally with this last slide to this um, article I mentioned twice before, who says not only according to this first principle that you have the right to leave this cooperative structure, but something else. It says, provided no resolution has been made to dissolve the state, every citizen is free to leave. Now, what does this mean, this first part? Provided no resolution has been made to dissolve the state, so in these cooperative principles, if no resolution has been made to dissolve the cooperative, it means that there could be a situation where they did not work well and they have to dissolve it or something like that. And if in that moment a member comes and says, I have the right to leave, then the cooperative can say, no, now you must wait. We are dissolving it now together and whatever the outcome is, you will then get your share. You cannot get out right now and leave all other problems to the other. This is a bit the idea. And so if you transfer it to the state, he too can say now, if in this lawsuit I want to go against him with many plaintiffs and uh, sort of class action and I will say I insist on my cooperative right to exit out of your structure, then the state has in principle no answer. He must accept our right because it's really the highest principle of cooperative structure. But he can say, oh, wait a minute, we are going to dissolve this organization and once we have made this resolution, you cannot get out of it. So actually, there is a choice between two possibilities, either freedom from the state, right to leave the structure, or dissolution of the state. And the state may choose. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>